Coming up next on Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. If you want to experience God's dream, don't think too high of yourself. Don't think too low of yourself. Think exactly right of yourself, who you really are. And it'll free you. Welcome to Living on the Edge. My name is Chip Ingram, and I'm your host, and it's good to be with you. You know, we're in a series that's talking about the five relationships that every human being on the face of the earth has. You know, you have a relationship with God, you have a relationship with the world system, and this third one is one we don't think about. You have a relationship with you. In fact, the person you talk to the most is you. And here's the issue. Most of us never come to grips with the real us, the real you. Uh, we imitate other people. We have identity issues. We're insecure. In this message, this broadcast, we're going to help you learn how to come to grips with the real you. This is one that people love and I think is going to be a great encouragement to you. Stay tuned. Well, as we start this session, let me start with a very, very quick review. Pull the camera back and we're talking about God's dream for your life. And we said Romans chapter 12, just sort of getting us back in the flow, is a picture, it's a profile of how you can receive the very best from God. And in our very first session, we said, you know, what is it that God really wants, remember? And we said, what God wants is you. Total surrender. You know, surrendered to God. That is what he wants. That's the channel through which his highest, best, and biggest blessings flow. And then in the next session, we talked about, okay, well, how do we get the best from God? And we learn we get the best from God when we have a no-yes proposition. We say no to the world and the pools of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we say yes to God, and we are transformed as our mind is renewed in order that we could actually experience his will, that which is good, well-pleasing, and perfect, fulfilling his highest and best design. Well, I want to then move to the next level because that's your relationship with God as a follower. That's your relationship to the world. And now we want to talk about our relationship to ourselves. And, and sometimes we don't even think we have that. But do you realize how many times a day you talk to yourself? <laughs> Psychologists call it self-talk. I mean, you tell your stuff. I mean, you talk to yourself all the time. Some of you do it out loud when you're driving, in fact, you know, <laughs> or when you're putting on your makeup or shaving. And I, I want to tell you that we're going to go on a journey and part of fulfilling and experiencing God's dream is you getting a sober self-assessment. You looking in the mirror, and not just the physical mirror, but in the mirror of your soul and, and, and realizing this is who God made me to be. These are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. These are my tendencies that, that honor him and, and help others, and these are my tendencies that dishonor him. And, and hurt me and others. And where you have this sober self-assessment, you really know who he made you to be. Because most of us spend most of our lives trying to be someone else or trying to please other people. Uh, the, the year is 1972, and I want to take you on a very brief journey of when I started to grapple with, actually, how do I look at myself? Developing a sober self-assessment. And I won't go into the long of it, but, okay, uh, my dad is an ex-Marine, Guam, Iwo Jima, Purple Heart, coach, teacher. Um, I'm a pretty driven type A personality. I don't know the Lord. Uh, he's an alcoholic, uh, a very kind and gentle one, no abuse or things like that. But, and so I, I learned that if you work hard and really get up early and bust it, you can really get to the top of your class. So I got good grades, and I got the scholarship in athletics and, you know, the head of this club, and, you know, I became successful. And, uh, and then I learned that there's success in different areas. So I learned that when you were with girls in high school, you needed to act sweet because that's important, and sometimes for very bad motives. I learned that when you were with teachers, you needed to act like the all-American boy, and yes, sir, and no, sir. Remember, this is the 70s. 
And then I, I learned that in the locker room, you need to cuss like a sailor, recruit the biggest, strongest guy on the team that everyone was afraid of, make him your best friend, and then mouth off and intimidate people, and they know never mess with Ingram because the big guy will take you down. And so you have all these different faces, and those are just the main groups. I, there's probably seven or eight other groups, and so I was like a chameleon, and I had learned to act different ways to different groups because the goal was what? Be successful. Get what you want. So I end up at a fellowship of Christian athletes camp. Coach paid for it. I'm not a Christian. I've never opened the Bible. I've never read the Bible. I felt like someone dropped me uh, into a group, and within about 10 minutes, I thought, oh, my God, and it was not a prayer. <laughs> I, I've been dropped into the land of Jesus freaks. What am I going to do? All these guys, I, I never, I've never said the word Jesus out loud. I went to a church that was a bad experience. I get a little Bible, and the good part was we played lots of athletics. But after two or three days, I heard a guy talk a little bit in the mornings. People really lived out the life. Part of it was kind of attractive, but I figured it was a cult, and they were trying to pull me into this weird religious group, and so I wasn't going to go there. And so every morning you were to read your Bible in the morning. It was a big, beautiful lawn, a lush lawn on this college campus, 600 athletes opening the Bible for 15 or 20 minutes before we ate breakfast and did sporting activities. And finally, by like the fourth day, the peer pressure kicked in, and I thought every, you know, 599 guys have an open Bible, and, and mine's like this. And so I thought, what the heck, I'll just fake it. So I opened my Bible. I do not suggest that this is how God normally speaks. <laughs> and so what this says I urge you, therefore, my dear brothers, in view of God's great mercy, that you offer your body as a living sacrifice, one that's holy and acceptable, something he would really like. It was like a good news translation. And don't any longer be conformed to the outer things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so your life could really turn out the way God wants it for you and in a way that would glorify him. And, by the way, don't think too highly of yourself more than you ought to think, but think of yourself with a sound, accurate judgment, the way God wants you to. And I read those three verses, and I had never heard of the Holy Spirit. But as I read them, and when it says, don't be conformed to this world, and don't think more highly of yourself. Uh, I mean, actually, I had a guy in Atlanta. This is 30 years, if you can imagine how bad this is. Guy in Atlanta heard me on the radio. Are you the same Chip Ingram that was, went to Gahan Lincoln High School? You know, yeah, yeah, hey, how you doing? Remember I lived across the street? Yeah, da 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 By the way, are you still as arrogant now as you were then? <laughs> you know, gospel truth. Hey, I'm an underachiever. I'm skinny. I'm short. I love basketball. So I'm this mouthy, arrogant, totally insecure, workaholic, overachiever because I don't like me, I don't know who I am, I don't know God, and all I know is that if you push, 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 and drive, 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 it makes you feel like someone for a little while. And I read those verses, and as I read that verse, I thought to myself, it was just like a picture, and, and I, I'm not, you know, I don't know how God works, but like a picture, like a video started playing, and I saw myself in the locker room cussing and acting tough and feeling really afraid inside, and, and it was all. And then, you know, kind of sweet-talking this girl, and, and then over here in class, and, and I just thought to myself, I hate me. I was the biggest hypocrite that I knew. And what I didn't realize is that theologians and psychologists agree on at least one thing. There's three basic questions we all ask ourselves. And you'll ask them your entire life. I've put them in your notes. And I started grappling with these three questions. The first question is, who am I? And it's an identity question. I mean, I mean who am I? And so we tell people, you know, well, I, I'm an Ingram. Well, I'm a part of a family. Or who am I? I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm an athlete. I'm a housewife. Um... Or I'm from Georgia, or I'm from California, or my passion is I'm a mom, that's who I am, or I'm a surfer, or I'm, a, I'm the CEO of. But there's so, somewhere we're asking this question, who am I, our identity? The second question we all ask is where do I belong? And that's about security. And so we join clubs, and, you know, when you're in high school and junior high, and later you have cliques, and, you know, who am I? This is my last name, if it's a famous last name, and... Who am I? This is my job. This is where I belong. Or here's the athletic team. Or, you know, isn't it? Have you ever seen as many people in our day wear other people's names on their back? 
Have you ever thought about that? I mean, all of us, you know, 45-year-old guys with a hack backwards with someone else's name, a jersey of a 22-year-old guy making $20 million a year. <laughs> Go LeBron, baby, you know. <laughs> Hello. I got the first time ever I was in Chicago for my daughter's um, graduation, Wrigley Field. Never been there. Classic baseball. I'm telling you, me and six other people were the only people there that didn't have a sweatshirt, a T-shirt, a jersey or something that said Chicago Cubs. And, you know, for a big city, and people treated each other like, hey, man, how you doing? I mean, those people outside downtown Chicago would not look each other in the eye. But, hey, we're Cubs fans. Why? Because this is where we belong. I'm not, don't, don't hear wrong. Just hear you are made to figure out who you are, and you're made to belong. And you need to belong. And so we find all kind of ways to belong. The third thing question we ask is, well, what am I supposed to do? And that's not about identity or security. It's about significance. Okay, I'm on this planet. I have some passions. I have some skills. I have some desires. Okay, what am I supposed to do? And we ask these questions through various stages and seasons of life over and over and over. And I want to tell you, God is going to give you the answer to those three questions because if you can't answer him, you can't experience his dream for your life. And he's going to answer him in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. But before we get there, I want to address one other thing. It's just a little cul-de-sac, if you will. I want to walk you through something that will help you understand why this will be hard until the day you die. And why? Because of what Jesus has done for you already and who you already are as a follower. That you can know who you are, where you belong, and what he wants you to do. But here's why it's difficult. Follow along in your notes. It's a section out of Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through about 13. The the scene is the garden. Uh, The problem, sin has entered the world. And it says, They heard the sound of the Lord of the God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God, among the trees of the garden. They've sinned. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Uh, this, this is not an informational question. It's a diagnostic question. God obviously knows where he is. He wants Adam to begin to ask the question, so where am I? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. We're going to come back to that. That pattern of relating to God and to people will mark the human race ever since. I was afraid. Why? Because I was naked. You can see parts of me that I'm uncomfortable with. Therefore, I hid. And God responds, who told you that you were naked? Another diagnostic question. I mean, where'd you get this information? Have you eaten from the tree of which I command you not to eat? Notice God is, how many questions here? Instead of condemnation, it's he wants Adam to come to grips with what's going on. And by the way, that's how God works with you and me. And then I'll notice, especially if, imagine being Eve in this setting as the man uh, talks about the real problem and why he realizes he's naked and has disobeyed. The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Translation, denial, it's not my problem, it's her problem and who made her anyway? (laughs) So blame shifting and ultimately it's God's fault. So let's go to Eve and find out what her solution to the issue is. So he's just, okay. Well, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And underneath this, you kind of hear this. And by the way, who is the big serpent maker anyway? And who created this earth? And who kind of put this garden here? And so she does the same thing. Now, I want to just pull out, you know, we don't have time to develop the whole text. I want to tell you, What's happened? Sin has entered the world. The fall has occurred. And the fall has marred our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and our relationship with ourselves. And if you don't understand how that plays out, you will chase your tail spiritually for the rest of your life. Notice, here's the three implications. Three obstacles to getting the right answer. Number one, fear rooted in shame. I was afraid. 
We live out of fear in our relationship with God. We live out of fear in our relationship with people. We're afraid to fail. We're afraid to be who we are. We're afraid to open up. We're afraid to be vulnerable. We're afraid to be honest. We're afraid to try. We're afraid to make a mistake. All that goes back to an identity issue. Second, hiding rooted in insecurity. I was naked. I don't want anyone to see me. If you really knew the real Chip Ingram, or if you really knew you put your name in it, unconsciously you feel like if people saw the real you, not what you project, not the sanctified, cleaned up part, but if they really knew the real you with some of the thoughts you've had and some of the things you've done, they would reject you. It's called image management. And the issue is not do you do it. The issue is just how much of it do you and I do. We're always projecting a better self. I'm a hard worker. A little work. I get up early. I do this. I did that. I met with so-and-so. You know, I went to this school. I mean, hello. We're human. But all that is about hiding. All that is I don't want you to see who I really am. And the third is blaming rooted in denial. Left to ourselves and without God's grace, this is our relational pattern. You will be in relationships because of fear. You will hide in your insecurity. And you'll blame other people, the government, Hollywood, your mom, your dad, your past, your boss. The uh, breakthrough for me was coming to grips with admitting and recognizing that I was insecure. It's really freeing. I was... Uh, took a little church, and it sounded real country. It's called Country Bible Church, Kaufman, Texas. Really neat. Town, when I went there, about 4,000. They've mushroomed. I think they're up to 5,000 now, 30 years later. <laughs> Didn't have any traffic lights. I got a couple traffic lights, and they're making progress, and a couple fast food places. And I'm 28 years old, and I go out there to be the pastor. There's 35 people, and it's sort of, I mean, way out in the country. Uh, 30 miles out, but then the church is another, like, six or seven miles way out in the country. And everyone has a shotgun in the back of their truck, and uh, it feels real kind of country, except you start to get to know the people, and the one guy owns the Yamaha dealership, he owns the Suzuki dealership, the apartments downtown, the other guy owns a, uh, a whole uh, accounting firm downtown, the other guy owns a uh, life insurance company. I mean, how does people just, like, own those? And so it was a bunch of very wealthy, influential people from Dallas that didn't want the hassle, moved 30 miles out in a nice small town, bought ranches and farms, built houses that looked like Southern Living, put Southern Living on their coffee table. I was introduced to that magazine by them. Never heard of it before. And, uh, and then they wanted to have a nice church out there so they didn't have to drive to Dallas. So let's get one of those young Dallas seminary type guys. We'll have him out here and he'll build maybe one of the kind of churches like the really good ones in Dallas. And so I come out, and my, my mom and dad are school teachers. Uh, my, my dad watched his farm sold out from under him in the Depression. Uh, my mom and dad together made uh, $4,200 combined salary their first year teaching. Uh, when I, I can still remember, we had two rooms in a rent house, and all three of us kids slept in this room, and um, my parents slept in the other room. And then, you know, about every five years, as life got better, we would, you know, upgrade a little bit. But I grew up with that Depression savings mentality and and actually this is hard to admit a, a prejudice against wealthy people and so now here I am with all these wealthy people and I'm intimidated to death I mean I'm intimidated to death and I feel small and they're smart and they're big and you know they've been to these prestigious schools and and um, and the more I got to know them however I started seeing some cracks and some pain and marriages and I start helping some of their kids and I realize man they, I think these people could it be that they're as messed up as me and and uh, and I didn't know what to do with it and then I came across a book by Paul Turnier it's probably out of print I'll give you the whole thesis of the book don't even have to read it it's called the strong and the weak Paul Turnier is a Swiss psychologist uh, it was translated into English I think it originally came out in French and the thesis of the book was a Christian psychologist who treated all these people for many, many years with great insight. And he says all people can be divided into two categories. Everyone is desperately insecure. We're all afraid. Just Genesis 3. Desperately insecure. 
He said some people cover their insecurity with strong reactions and some people with weak reactions. And the whole book is stories of people of weak reactions and strong reactions. So when you meet people who power up, come down, do you know who I am? You know how many people report to me? They let you know who they mean and, you know, they had their picture with President Bush. And by the way, I was the CEO of this and this and this and this. And do you know how many letters behind my name? Do you? He said they're desperately insecure. The more people are strong, 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 outbursts of anger, you know what? That's all to keep people at a distance. And guess what? It works. Because if you keep people at a distance, they don't know who you really are and they don't get rejected. And all of a sudden, isn't that a little bit different picture than being afraid of those people? He said there's other people that have weak reactions. And they have fears, the little boy, the little girl that's afraid just like all the rest of us. And instead, they kind of look at their toes and I could never do that. And they're super shy and they withdraw and they won't try anything. And guess what? After a while, you try and help, try and help. And pretty soon, you just distance yourself because you can't help them. They really don't want any help. Guess what? Now they're safe too. And the whole book was, guess what? Welcome to life. You're insecure. I'm insecure. Everyone's insecure. <laughs> and I remember reading that and I thought, you know, I sat down at this meal and they started doing this stuff. These strong reactions came out, these very powerful people. And I'm sitting there going, he's really insecure. <laughs> oh, this is really cool. He's as messed up as I am. And pretty soon, you know, I was just, you know, then I, I would learn to bring up a few of my fears. And all of a sudden, these powerful men go, yeah, me too. And pretty soon, bonds occurred and relationships occurred. And um, I will tell you what, you can learn to grow and learn to break the cycle and learn who you are when you can let that down, accept who God made you, and then move forward. We'll talk about how that looks in just a minute. Uh, I'll never forget my first time. It's called the National Religious Broadcasters, and all the broadcasters come together. And it's a big event, and you know, thousands of people. And, and I got invited to this dinner, first time ever. And it's like you know, all the people you've ever heard speak in here were at this dinner, about 30 or 40 of them. And they seat me next to Chuck Swindoll. <laughs> Mr. Swindoll. I mean, it wasn't quite that bad, but I'm thinking, like, great. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, approach number one. Hey, Chuck, how you doing? <laughs> Chipper here. We're on nine stations. How are you guys coming? <laughs> I don't think I'll go there. Uh, and I just sat, and I didn't know what to say. And, and he's a really, really warm guy. And so I thought, well, I think you should start with honoring him. I said, excuse me, Dr. Swindoll, uh, my name's Chip, and I'm real new at this. And, oh, well, my name's Chuck. And he reached out his hand. Oh, great. I said, can I just tell you something before we get going here? He said, sure. I said, I'm really out of my league. I don't know what I'm doing. This is a very threatening environment. Do you think you could give me a few tips on kind of how to go through this whole broadcasting thing? Heart comes open. Walls come down. Chuck Swindoll scoots his chair over, puts his arm around me. He says, Chip, you know, let me share a few things with you. Every year at that dinner, he's taken about a half hour with me and almost like a prophet said, well, here's where the ministry is. Here's probably what you need to be thinking about next year. Why? See, we don't have to impress people. Who you actually are is the most attractive person on the planet. And, and, and just accepting because of the fall, I'm insecure, you're insecure, let's ask ourselves then instead of denial and blaming and hiding, how do we discover who we are? How do we discover where we belong? And how do we discover what we're supposed to do? And do it knowing that, you know, we'll always struggle with this. So let's dig into the text. God's answer to answering these three critical questions, who you are, is verse 3. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. And write in your notes, if you will, to think. I mean, they're giving the... The inference there, but in the original language, that word think is repeated again. Um, but rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of the faith that God has given you. Circle the word think, and then circle the word ought, and we can remember it's ought to think. Then circle the word, uh, again, notice, think, and then sober judgment. I mean, that's only one verse, and all four of those words, think, 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 and sober judgment is the same root word. And then notice what he says. 
He says, in accordance with the measure of the faith that God has given you. One commentator says, this is the standard by which God is to evaluate ourselves. This is not subject, subjective faith like faith in God. This is the faith. This is getting a biblically accurate view of yourself. And so the command is to think accurately about yourself. Not too high, not too low. That's a command. If you want to experience God's dream, don't think too high of yourself. Don't think too low of yourself. Think exactly right of yourself, who you really are. And it'll free you. Well, let me ask you, uh, how do you view yourself? I mean, just, you know, if you had to choose one or the other, do you tend to err on the side of maybe I think a little too highly of myself? Or maybe I think a little too lowly of myself. You know, my experience is, is that the latter is the case for many people. In fact, most people. And most people think they don't bring much to the table. Uh, you don't think accurately about yourself. And in fact, many, many Christians I meet think, well, that's pride or that's arrogance to, to think I'm good at something or I have value and I have dignity. And in fact, there was a theology of many, many years ago where you know, people talked about what a worm you are and you don't have any worth or you don't have any value. Now, that's bad theology. You know, we can't please God. We can't earn any merit whatsoever apart from what Christ has done. But every human being is made in the image of God. You are valuable. You are wonderful. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And for others, uh, to hide that insecurity, uh, maybe you've done a little bit of the, uh, what I call the Chip Ingram show. I was so desperately insecure. I was loud. I was arrogant. My chest was puffed out. I told people how great I was. I bragged. And all of it was to hide that little boy that was afraid inside. You know, I pray that you can be with us on our next broadcast. And, you know, if you can't, you can go to our website and you get all that information where you can begin to listen to the series, where you can learn and grow. God made you exactly the way he made you. We're going to talk very specifically about how to get an accurate view of yourself in our next broadcast. So I pray that you'll be with us. Here's what I want you to remember. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want you to look in the mirror and see yourself exactly the way God does.